Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Biblical Genetics. I'm Dr. Rob. I'm coming to you today from Champ's Clock Shop in Douglasville, Georgia. I wanted to talk about the waiting time problem for evolution. I thought, what better place could I go except a clock shop? And this is an amazing place. Now, if you know me, you know that I love electronics. I love gadgets. I love mechanisms. I'm a huge uh, fan, fan if you call it that, of the Antikythera mechanism, this ancient celestial clock that was found in a shipwreck uh, off of a little island in Greece. I've been to the British Naval Museum. I've seen Harrison's clocks. Yes, the first clocks that were ever able to travel aboard a ship. And the accurate timekeeping aboard ship allowed us to finally crack the longitude problem. Show notes. Amazing things in the world of clocks and amazing things here in the world of clocks. I have seen so many fascinating things. I mean, grandfather clocks and cuckoo clocks and all sorts of timekeeping devices. The waiting time problem is very well known to evolutionary theoreticians. They've been writing about this for decades. There's all sorts of computer models and mathematical models to try to explain how mutations propagate in a population. But if they can't explain it mathematically, evolution is dead in the water, and they know it. So there's all sorts of ways around this. In fact, if you go online or you get on some uh, chat site, you, you start saying these things to people, they're going to say, oh, no, we answered that long ago. And then you ask them for a reference, they'll give you a reference for maybe something like a bacterial population. But that's irrelevant. The waiting time problem is for people and elephants, not E. coli. You see, there are so many bacteria in the world, and the mutation rate is so high that essentially every single possible mutation that can appear in an E. coli genome happens every single day in some bacterium somewhere in the world. So if we're waiting for a mutation to occur, it's going to occur in bacteria. That's not the question. The question is, how do long-lived species with long generation times and high mutation rates, how do they possibly survive over time? And if you're depending upon a positive mutation to appear, how long does that take? That's the waiting time problem. So. My colleagues, uh, John Sanford is the leading author in this paper, um, using a, a computer model called Mendel's Accountant, which I wrote a thorough review of in the Journal of Creation. It's now on creation.com. There'll be a link in the show notes called A Successful Decade for Mendel's Accountant. Essentially, the most sophisticated evolutionary modeling program was written by creationists in order to test evolutionary theory. And piece after piece after piece after piece of the puzzle has been solved by this problem. And finally, after lots of work, they turned their sights on to the waiting time problem. And they said, okay, in evolutionary theory, we supposedly evolved from a small population in Africa. If you hear the numbers, they'll say something like, or the evolutionists will say something like, uh, effective population size of about 10,000 individuals in a bottleneck, which means we went from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, improving, because Homo sapiens certainly is, is superior to Homo erectus, in a very small population that remained very small for a very long time. And somehow in that process, we evolved into basically an ape-like thing to a species that can fly to the moon. That is a very interesting question, and it's mathematical, and we can model that using Mendel's accountant. So here's what they did. They said, we're going to start with a population of 10,000 individuals, and we're going to wait for a single letter to change. There's an A, and we want to change to a G. How long will that take? Well, you don't actually need a mathematical model to do that or a computer model to do that because we know the basic mutation rate. Under a lot of simplifying assumptions, the mutation rate is, they usually say it's like one times 10 to the negative eight. Negative eight, what does that even mean? Okay, math. 10 to the sixth is a million. 10 to the eighth is 100 million. 10 to the negative eight is one over 100 million. In other words, in any stretch of 100 million letters, there'll be about one mutation there per year or sometimes per generation, depending on what you're talking about. So let's talk in generations because evolution doesn't care about years. It only cares about generations. Now, interestingly, since the time of the human and human chimpanzee common ancestor, there have only been a few hundred thousand generations in the evolutionary system. That's not a lot of time. That's not a lot of generations for change to happen. And there are millions of differences between humans and chimpanzees, tens of millions, but only a few hundred thousand generations. 
But some of those differences are relevant. Some of them, though, are important. Some of them gave us a larger brain. They gave us the ability to walk upright. They lost our hair. I mean, mutations have been important and advantageous to the human species in evolution. I don't believe this, but in an evolutionary model. So how long would it take for a single letter change as important to arise? That's the question. So in their model, 10,000 people, genome size of 3 billion times 2 is 6 billion, a mutation rate of one mutation for every 100,000 letters, per generation, per individual. And their mutation though, in order to get it to work, they had to have a very strongly advantageous mutation. They say, let's, um, or they said, let's say that this mutation, when it appears, confers on that individual that carries it a 10% reproductive advantage. The selection coefficient is 0.1, or that individual is more likely to have offspring than any random chump in that population that doesn't carry that mutation. So this mutation allows the individual to have more babies. That's what evolution depends upon. It's not about death. Selection's not about death. It's about reproductive advantage. The more, more offspring you have, the more advantageous you are, theoretically. Okay, so a 10% reproductive advantage actually is profound because most mutations don't do anything. Most mutations are tiny effect. Most mutations are actually bad and selection has to get rid of them. That's a whole nother problem. That's called genetic entropy. But for the waiting time problem, we're waiting for an advantageous mutation to appear. How long does that take? Well, given a stretch of 100,000 letters, one out of 100,000 generations, that's when that will appear. Generation time is about 30 years. That's about 3 million years. Whoa. That's profound, just waiting for that letter change. However, it's not that simple because just because you have a mutation at that spot doesn't mean you have the right mutation. If you want the A to turn to a G, the A can turn to a T or a C, but it's worse than that because most mutations are lost. In another Mendel's accountant paper that they uh, presented at the International Conference of Creationism several years ago, this team showed that something like 99.99 something percent of all new mutations are randomly lost, even the beneficial ones. Here's how that works. Give an individual that has a mutation. That mutation is going to be passed on to children half the time. He has two copies of each gene. Well, he's only going to give one gene to the child, and it's a 50-50 chance. If a child doesn't inherit that mutation, that mutation is gone. In a population of 10,000 individuals, if the population size is constant, that means that on average, every couple has two children. Well, two children. One child has a 50-50 chance. The other child has a 50-50 chance. 25% of the time, that mutation is not even passed on. It's gone. Well, in the next generation now, maybe one child has it. 50-50 chance that that mutation doesn't get passed to the next generation. The probability of losing mutations is huge when they only appear in one copy in one individual in a large population. I imagine it's like, uh, imagine a bunch of people dancing in a field next to a cliff. And every once in a while, one of those people just steps off the cliff. Ah! Well, that person just got removed from the gene pool. Same thing with genes. If they don't get passed on, they're removed from the gene pool and most all mutations are lost. However, with this particular mutation they're modeling with a very strong positive selection coefficient, about 90%, so instead of 99.99, but only about 90% of the mutations are lost due to random chance. So your, your waiting time has to be multiplied by 10. If 90% are lost, only 10% live, you have to wait longer, much longer for that lucky one to finally appear and stay. So there's several things here. We have the waiting time to the first appearance. Most of those are lost. That's irrelevant. Then you have the waiting time to that lucky one that doesn't go away. But that's not the waiting time. The waiting time is how long does it take that mutation to spread throughout the population and replace the original variant. That's the waiting time. Population geneticists talk about something called fixation or fixity. And this is hard because we don't use that word fix 
like we used to use it. In fact, we use it as repair. What they mean is stuck, as in fixed in place, immovable, can't change anymore. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine that you have a population of nothing but brown-eyed people. Let's say 7 billion brown-eyed people. And someone appears with a single letter change that creates blue eyes. Now, that's not true. Blue eyes is not a single letter change. It's not simple genetics for eye color. But imagine that a blue-eyed gene appears and it gives that person a reproductive advantage of 10%. How long will it take for that gene to spread throughout all seven billion people and replace the brown to the point where brown no longer exists. It's fixed, the blue-eyed gene will be fixed. You can't go back to brown, brown is gone. That's what we're talking about and the waiting time is profound. Using that mutation rate and that population size and waiting for a single letter should take about three million years one letter change. In the model that they worked up and did a lot of experimenting on, they calculated 1.5 million years. Now, why is the model not matching the math? Well, because they're making assumptions in favor of evolutionary theory. In fact, when you're doing modeling, the results you get are entirely dependent upon your model assumptions. And if you get to within an order of magnitude, that's a factor of 10, that's a happy day. It's like, yes, we did it. If you're off by a factor of a thousand, then you go back to the drawing board. But if you're within any, you know, close range, that is an excellent model. And to be 1.5 million when the math told you 3 million, that's something you take home and you write up in a paper. And yet notice that 1.5 million years to the fixation of that new mutation is lower than the evolutionary assumption is actually in favor of evolutionary theory. They're actually doing a very conservative model saying, okay, evolution, we're gonna give you every benefit we can possibly think of, and yet it still fails. If it was higher than the evolutionary thing, then the skeptics say, oh yeah, you're just trying to push it towards creationist ideas. So this is really cool that they came within the right ballpark and are on the conservative side of the equation. 1.5 million years is a long time. Okay, but what if you reduce the selective advantage? 10% is ridiculous. I mean, what mutation gives an individual 10% more children than other mutations? Does that even exist? Yeah, it might exist, but they'd be extremely rare. What if it's more biologically realistic? What if it's 1%? What if it's 0.1%? Now we're getting closer to where most mutations lie in the point something percent range. Well, for 10%, it's 1.5 million years. For 1%, it's 15 million years. For 0.1%, it's 150 million year waiting time. If you need this A to turn to a G, you have to wait for 150 million years. This is an evolutionary impossibility. You can't wait that long. Humans and chimpanzees have supposedly only been separated for six million years. You can't wait for 150 million years for some advantageous mutation to appear that must have appeared in history if we're going to explain humans from a chimpanzee common ancestor. Okay, but that's only for one letter. What if we're talking about more than one letter? What if we need two letters to appear? Now, theoretically, there could be, say, an enzyme that if you change one letter, it makes the enzyme better. Change another letter, it makes the enzyme even better. Change either one and it gets better, but change them both and it's better still. We're not talking about those enzymes. Some you know, gradual stepwise progression. We're talking about things that require an all or nothing. Change a letter, it does nothing. Change another letter, it does nothing. But change both letters, now you have a new function or an improved function. We see that in biology. Those are the things that waiting time has to explain. So let's say that, that this exists. Somewhere in the genome is an enzyme that requires two mutations at the same time to have some improved function. Well, if you're waiting for two letter changes, you're talking about 84 million years, not 1.5 million years. If you need three, you're talking about 380 million years. Five, two billion years. If you want eight changes, you're talking about something older than the Big Bang age of the universe. This is why the waiting time is so profound because the numbers are telling us that it's not actually gonna happen in evolutionary history. All right, what if you have larger populations though? What if you had 
a million individuals instead of 10,000? What if you had a billion individuals? So it actually reduces the waiting time because you have more copies of that gene, more possibilities for that gene to mutate where you want it to mutate. Now, it takes longer for the, that new gene to spread through the population, but because you have more copies, that actually overwhelms the, the waiting time. And so if you have a million people, that five-letter combination, instead of two, being two billion years, now you're talking about 482 million years. If you had a billion people, it's only 40 million years. But evolution can't handle that because we have to drive changes in much shorter time frames. They don't have 40 million years to explain the difference between humans and chimpanzees. They only have six or seven million years at most. And even that has doubled since I was in college. It used to be three million years. It used to be less than that. But they keep on bumping up the number to try to account for the evolutionary differences that they see. And yet even then, the waiting time problem presents a profound mathematical challenge. I don't believe that they can do it if we stick to the real argument. Not bacteria, not gene promoters, but specific letters. Now, granted, evolution is supposed to be random. So what if that letter change happened? What if another letter change could have happened? And there are, you know, 20 something thousand genes. So maybe you don't need that letter change. Maybe you need any number of 50 to 100 to 1,000 specific letter changes to happen to drive the evolution of humans. And you have 20,000 different genes to work with. Okay, we can talk about that too. We can model that also. And it doesn't work. Because if a letter appears in some gene that gives it some selective advantage, great. Well, that's going to take a long time to propagate. You need another one to appear at the same time. That's going to take a long time to propagate. They're going to be interfering with one another. There's only so many babies that humans can have. Human females can't have 800 children and 798 of them get removed for natural selection purposes. That's not the way it works. We have a little more than two per generation. That's normal. That's a problem. Because that means that there aren't a lot of extra children to remove. You can't have 20, 100, 1,000 different genes, different advantageous mutations all clamoring for attention. What happens is the selective process bogs down in something called selective interference. And that's another big issue for the waiting time problem in that, okay, you want random mutations? Okay, let's just say that random mutations with a 10% reproductive advantage happen at random and anywhere it happens, that that is going to be selectable. Great. You can only get one or two, maybe three. And Hal Dane's estimate, a few hundred to a few thousand. I think his estimate is way over the top. But you can't get that many changes, even in evolutionary time. Therefore, evolutionary mathematics tells us that evolution doesn't work. That, my friends, is the waiting time problem. Now, before I go, I want to give a giant shout out to all of my supporters on buymeacoffee.com. Stephanie S. once again, but a new Stephanie, Stephanie F. Thank you so much. And Brian M., I really appreciate it. Over on patreon.com, Dave H., Thank you, sir. You're actually above my top tier, but in the top level, Adam B, M. Matsky, and Rob S. I really appreciate you guys partnering with me. Uh, Daniel P, James R, Jeff V, D, and Mark K. You're in that middle tier. Guys, you're awesome. But not to be forgotten, Jonathan P and Ted H. You guys are helping me so much. In fact, I have two brand new lights that I'm filming with because I knew I was going to do an indoor shoot. I've got a new cage around my camera that I can attach lights to. I've got all these new little teeny helps and aids that are making my production just a little bit better. I'm going for a new microphone next. So all you people listening to me on the podcast, I'm going to start sounding a little bit better in the near future. But for all of you that are helping, praying, sharing, thank you. I could do nothing without you. And I want to thank again the Champion family for allowing me to come to Champ's Clock Shop and film in this beautiful location, a perfect location, to talk about the waiting time problem. Mm -hmm.